any of the information that I share. This is for general medical purposes only. I am not offering any um, specific advice for any one person. Obviously, everybody's individual. And I need to take a much more detailed um, history on somebody before I would ever be able to give accurate individual advice. So here we go. So the first question that was asked of me is, I'm curious about dental sealants for kids. Our dentists recommend these for our six-year-old due to multiple cavities. What is your point of view on the harm versus benefit of these? Okay, so I know that the American Dental Association and the Academy of Pediatrics is now recommending that all children have this done in their toddlerhood years, even before it used to be we would send kids to the dentist for the first time at three years, but now they're recommending these sealants put in on, um, on every single child. Now, one of the core philosophies that I have looked to when I'm trying to figure out what the right recommendation for somebody is, is I ask myself a question, what does every other mammal do? And if we're doing it differently than everybody else, I do question who's got it right. Now, there could be certain circumstances where a person um, does need that sealants that I do recommend. And in a situation such as this, where a person um, it, um, has multiple cavities, I think that there it's, it would be a most likely a benefit for, um, for that kind of person as well. Now, the risk that um, and the concern that people have expressed is that some of the products that are used as sealants contain BPA bisphenol A, um, which is we know has been an issue in terms of plastics. And that's what you'll hear people talk about. But I did some deep diving onto this because the American Dental Association did a product review on this. And they and what they had come up with, and I realize it's the American Dental Association, so um, there could be some bias to this. But, you know, I would certainly hope that if they're putting data out and the information that I'm going to share with you is pretty specific, that I would think it would be kind of hard to um, to fudge this. But nonetheless, I always want to point out the source of the information that I'm getting it from. But about five years ago, they did this review and they found that when a person, when a, when a child has B, uh, sealants on it, the amount of BPA that would be released on a daily basis was 0 0.9 nanograms of, of the BPA. And the environmental agents, the environmental protection agency actually lists 1 million nanograms as the, what the maximum a person should be exposed to. And this is 0 0.09 nanograms. Now, I realize that people say, I don't want to give my kid any BPA, and I get that. I also would venture to say that you're probably getting more than 0 0.09 nanograms on a regular basis anyways from just how it's in ubiquitous and other types of things. Um, now, there were a couple of things that I also learned. First of all, the most of it is actually um, from right when it's placed. So if a person's able to do like a, a swish and spit, they'd actually remove a lot of the loose because once it's in a sealant and it's stuck there, then of course um, it's not really going anywhere. Now, we know that when people are when we have concerns about BPA in plastics, one of the concerns is if you're heating it. So that's why we say don't use um, BPA containing bowls or plates in the microwave, for instance. You know, but if it's something cold, it's probably not coming on. So, you know, unless a child is eating, um, you know, is drinking something hot, there may not be an issue except for those circumstances in the first place. It's also possible that our, that if a person like were to take a Q-tip, a cotton swab, and with and as after it's placed, after the BPA is placed, after a little bit to um and it's dried and set, to be able to take that and kind of like rub it, kind of like a toothbrush on any of the areas where it was applied, then some more of it will come off of the um onto the swab there, and therefore not getting into the child. So, of course, with everything that we do. We have to ask ourselves what the risk versus benefits. You know, of course, asking whether, you know, someone is using fluoride. I know some people don't want to use fluoride. If somebody was having um, multiple uh, cavities, I think that the use of fluoride makes more sense if someone was otherwise hesitant. The reality is that the amount of fluoride that a person would get from brushing their teeth, um, the amount you'd have to consume that amount for over, I think it's like over, um, 50 years or something like that, um, swallowing it in order to cause a problem from a fluoride perspective. But uh, that's why we say spit out toothpaste as opposed to when we use babies, we always tell them don't use fluoride toothpaste until they can spit because then, of course, they could be swallowing the fluoride and that could be more of an issue there. But, you know, something needs to be done 
in order to reverse this. Now, of course, we can be asking, you know, what's the child eating? Are they eating sweets all the time or, you know, other types of sugary things, sodas in particular, iced teas, those can be particularly much because they coat the area since it goes in there. You know, do we brush our teeth right after we eat in order to try to get some of the, um, the food particles off as well? So, yeah, so as with everything, there's a pro versus con and weighing, uh, it, writing out an individual list will really be helpful in terms of trying to weigh the risk versus benefit there. But of course, lots of cavities and infections and losing teeth, that's a risky thing to have happen too. If you like what you've seen, see that subscribe button there? Please click it and turn it from red to gray. 